we have some research done in Brazil that shows that entrepreneurs consider themselves very little and innov innovative. Uh, so, for instance, if, I don't know if you've heard of GEM, the General Entrepreneurship Monitor, uh, where approximately 10% of entrepreneurs over here consider, th consider that their products are innovati innovative for their clients or potential clients. Um, looking, I, I, you talk a lot about education uh, and the importance of education actually to stimulate innovation in the future. But looking now into Brazil, do you think there's other things that we can do that have may, might have a shorter term in, ter in response for the country? So we're impatient. We, we can't wait 10 years for kids to become grown-ups. Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. There are tons of things to be done. First of all, let me just address this point about um, uh, uh, um, so you're familiar with two-by-two two matrices, right? <laughs> so um, if you have high-low innovation, high-low entrepreneurship, right? If it's a high-low, so, you know, up here you get your stars, right? Your, you know, Pixar's and Facebook's and stuff like that. And then um, if you have uh, high uh, entrepreneurship but low um, innovation, uh, you get um, the guy who owns 20 McDonald's franchises, which is very entrepreneurial and, you know, very value-creating but not particularly creative. If you um, have a uh, high, um, oh, wait a second, I, I got them reversed. Anyway, you get the point. If I have high um, innovation but low entrepreneurship, maybe I'm a think tank operator or maybe I'm a design house or maybe I'm just somebody that comes up with, you know, a lot of ideas that don't get executed, right? Because you need, I, ideas don't become innovation until they're adopted in society. Thomas Edison was not an innovator when he invented the light bulb. He was an inventor. He, it was only when he started selling lots of light bulbs that he was an innovator. So if you're a, a person with a lot of great ideas, but you have low entrepreneurial ability, you know, good luck. And then, of course, nobody wants to be low innovation, low entrepreneurship. So um, it's not surprising, though, that um, uh, entrepreneurs here would look for existing business models and then build on top of those. So I, th I would take the longer view and say, well, fine. So, I mean, this is how the Internet business got built in China. People said, what's the Chinese Facebook? What's the Chinese Amazon? What's the Chinese blah, blah, blah? And, and then they made hundreds of billions of dollars. Now they're investing the money in more a, a new wave of creative um, uh, ventures. And, uh, but they, meanwhile, they built an, an ecosystem. Um, I think that um, there are a few points to be made. One is that um, uh, it's lonely being an entrepreneur. And uh, one of the great uh, strengths of Silicon Valley it's, is that it's a community and it has a culture. So um, in America in the 18th uh, and 19th centuries, we had a custom called barn raising. This is interesting. So a barn raising was where if you were the new person in a community, everybody owed you a day. And they would come, and in one day, you would have a barn because everybody in the community would work on it. And then your obligation would be to contribute a day when the next person came to town. Great. And that's how Silicon Valley works. You know, uh, Unless you are shown to be a bad person because of your behavior, because it's a small community, uh, you show up and people are eager to help you eager to introduce you to uh, other people, to give you some feedback on your idea, you know, whatever it, it might be. So um, that takes away the loneliness. Um, so I think one thing is about creating a community of entrepreneurs, whether it's a virtual or a face-to-face -face community, events, all that. And I know a lot of that stuff is happening already. I think, uh, you know, obviously a second point is that you need, I mean, innovation happens when you have talent, ideas and resources, and they're blended together effectively, right? So if you look at the resource side, um, I know there's a lot of money in Brazil, but I, I, uh, my impression is that early stage venture capital uh, uh, is in short supply, and uh, you agree with that. So, so, and when I say early stage, I mean, you know, you come to me and you have an idea, and I think it's great, and there's no way of proving it to the point where I don't even want to see your business plan because I know it'll be wrong. It'll, it's just an exercise in futility. Which is also why I think that, you know, business plan courses should really be part of management courses, and true entrepreneurship courses should not be about business plans. They should be about creating new ideas and testing them. It's a different discipline. 
Okay? So um, me as an early stage investor, I would judge your, your character, and I would judge the quality of the idea, and I would see how my gut felt, and then I would give you or not give you the money. Uh, we raised quite a bit of money for edge makers from the venture community in uh, the U.S., and it took 20 minutes. 20 minutes, that was it. And uh, I never sent them a single document. I never sent them a business plan. Uh, I think after a year, I sent them a one-page financial statement, <laughs> which basically said, all costs, no revenue, right? Um, and there are people that are in the business of early stage investing, and our guys, um, uh, are working on their uh, are working out of their 11th vent early stage venture fund. This is a, a subspecialty in the investment area. So I think a lot of venture capital is kind of a little bit like banking, which is they have give you money when you don't need it, but there's this gap, right? I mean, what you, part of the reason that maybe there are a lot of me too ventures is because, you know, if I walk into somebody's office and I say, well, you know, I mean, look at how much money these guys, uh, you know, with uh, um, you know, Pinterest made, and I want to do a, a Brazilian version of Pinterest, there's security in that. But if I come in and I say I'm doing something radically new, um, the feeling of security kind of goes away. And by the way, early stage investing is not for everybody, right? The other part of resources, and again, I'm going to make a comparison to Silicon Valley, is that um, there are abundant human resources for getting things done. So there are lawyers, there are PR agents, there are um, accountants, there are real estate uh, people who get you an office. I mean, literally, you don't need incubators in Silicon Valley because you can set yourself up in business in 48 hours with a corporation, a beautiful office, temporary staffing, furniture, plants, uh, you know, accounting firms. I mean, it, you just do it yourself. If you can't do it yourself, go home because you're not an entrepreneur, right? So here, it's obviously a little bit more difficult because those services are not bundled. And if they are bundled, they may be bundled in kind of an incubator model that may or may not be encouraging of the rock star entrepreneurs. I mean, for me personally, if an entrepreneur says to me, I really need to be in an incubator, I would question whether they're really an entrepreneur. Because, you know, I, mean, I, would, I would not say this, but other people have said that incubators are like life support for ventures. And you'd rather not have that kind of a venture. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on. There are a lot of, there are a lot of you know, there's, there's issues around uh, uh, intellectual property, right, which is I, the idea part. So in America, obviously, we have this very fluid culture where, you know, professors can become multimillionaires and, you know, they have offices that, you know, manage technology transfer. And, um, you know, in, in most other countries, and I think Brazil is somewhere in the pack, although closer to the, probably the American culture, you know, professors are pure and they, are, they're like, you know, people from a almost, well, I, I won't say it. So they're, they're pure. And um, the idea that they would make money is culturally disturbing. And the idea that a uh, academic research center should pursue uh, uh, ideas that are of practical value to society goes against academic freedom. Because, hey, I'm supposed to be able to think about whatever I want in a pure way. Now, in America, the culture has changed a lot. You know, the academic culture, you know, people understand that they got tenure and they have grants because they're supposed to be doing important things. But the culture of universities uh, has shifted in the following respect. For example, there's this thing called the uh, Center for Synthetic Biology at San Francisco. I've been doing some advisory work for them, which is this huge area of where information technology and material science and biology are coming together to pr produce new materials, new drugs, new diagnostics, everything. And um, they have courses there. And the courses have titles like from the bench, meaning the research bench, to the IPO. Because what they want is to create a blended culture of the most pure basic science and the most practical um, uh, business execution. And they want the people who are the medical people to actually be thinking about health policy issues. Not because it will restrict their thinking, but just because you'd much rather have them thinking about um, how to do it in a way that benefits society. So yeah, I could go on and on. I mean, there's, it's a big topic, but those are a few, a few ideas.
John, congratulations for your brilliant speech. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a philosophical question. Okay, great. How much uh, mysticism involves in innovation and all the beautiful things you spoke? When you say mysticism, mysticism, spiritualism. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Do you think mysticism is a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing. Okay. Good thing okay. I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand your question. So, um, well, many um, uh, religious disciplines have focused on uh, training the mind to be more creative and also to be more in creat creative with integrity. You know, if you look at Buddhism. Buddhism has an ethics that if we all followed 5% of it, the world would be a whole lot better. So um, I think that there is a kind of a moral vacuum right now in the world. Uh, it used to be, I mean, when I was in studying philosophy in college, you know, I took courses on ethics. I actually took four or five courses on ethics. And we don't have an ethics in global society right now. You know, the ethics might be about making money or it might be about being stronger than the other guy or you know, trying to get away with things. But um, I think this idea of innovation as uh, the capabilities that allow for the realization of the future you want uh, uh, really works if enough people agree on what that future is. And I think we want a world that is peaceful, it is um, adventuresome, it is uh, opportunity rich, uh, it's a world where children can express their full potential, on and on and on, right? And so, uh, in some respects, I would confess that there is a kind of a, um, a values uh, platform behind a lot of the stuff that I do. I don't admit that in public that often. Um, and also that um, a lot of what used to be called mystical experience is actually very much about how people work together and individually to harness the creativity that they have. I mean, everybody's creative. We're all born with creativity, and we can't really explain that. You know, it's something that we were given somehow by somebody or something, and um, and then it's up to us to figure out how to express that, and you know, for good, for evil, for mediocrity, for whatever, right? So I, I would not go around and say that I'm doing this because uh, of mystical reasons, but I, I, if we agree on the language, which is that um, there's a moral framework and there's a a deeper kind of philosophical layer of creativity that then comes into the world. I mean, Steve Jobs, for instance, as probably most of you know, uh, he, um, uh, he dropped out of college because uh, he felt it was too much of a financial burden on his parents. So he's a very principled young man, and he went to India, and he became a vegetarian, and he followed a guru, and he meditated, and, um, and then he came back and started Apple Computer. Uh, Mitch Kapor, a friend of mine from Yale, uh, who started uh, uh, Lotus 123, that became Lotus. He was one of the early successful guys. Uh, when he was at Yale, he was a transcendental meditation instructor. Right? He took the special course from the Maharishi about how to fly. That was how deeply he was into it. And then he became a tech multi-gazillionaire. Right? So there's a lot of uh, people who've experienced unusual things and then had that feed into their entrepreneurial career. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, John. My name Hi. is Jose Ricardo. And thanks for your presentation. I'd like to know, you know, what Edge Makers is. Like, uh, how can we contribute, or how does it work? Thank you. So, um, Edge Makers is a learning system that includes a curriculum that is intended for high school students. Um, it's one class per week for f uh, five years. And right now, what we are trying to figure out is how to make relationships in Brazil to uh, be able to insert this curriculum into schools um, and also uh, to bring Portuguese language content via a self-directed learning web platform. So we're talking to uh, foundations and companies that might sponsor a large number of kids to take the edge makers learning experience. Uh, we're talking with uh, schools directly. We're talking to some government agencies. Um, the problem with innovation in education 
in any country, and Brazil is no exception, is partly that the traditional way of distributing educational content uh, favors repeating the success formula that a distribution company might have enjoyed. So we have an algebra course, we have the new algebra course, we continue to uh, incrementally improve. But something like our curriculum is, is new. And so um, we want to work through the traditional distribution system, but it's a little bit like blowing an elephant through a straw, you know, and therefore we, we'd like to get 100,000 kids involved with edge makers over the next 12 months in Brazil. We'd like to get a million kids uh, in edge makers within the next five years. And if you think about it, um, what would Brazil look like uh, in five years uh, uh, if there were a million kids, or there were going to be a million kids who had studied creativity and innovation, which is our first course, design thinking, which is the second course, uh, story and um, change making, which is the third course, so narrative development, communications, character and collaboration, which is emotional intelligence for innovation, and then entrepreneurship and, you know, sort of lean startup for kids wrapped around uh, challenges, sustainability, peace. You know, we're working closely with Al Gore because he has a lot of great content that, you know, we want to use to create junior climate activists, right? So um, what, would, what would Brazil or any country be like if you had a million kids who at the age of 16 had already had all of that knowledge? And not, we're not, there's going to be zero lectures. It's all project-based learning and collaboration and activity-based. They're going to have more knowledge about entrepreneurship than a large percentage of, you know, people who are business practitioners. And they'll be 16 and 17. So what will they do? I mean, they'll be out there. They'll be making different decisions about how they want to spend their time. So we're looking for partners. We're looking for friends. You know, we've, we've been very lucky to meet some great people and get some great support. But we're still at the early stages of figuring out how to launch edge makers, uh, how to get it into some schools, how to get some government support to legitimize the idea that it might be a strategy for a city or a state. Um, and also, uh, we think that uh, there's a good opportunity for us in the uh, corporate and the, um, the foundation sector, because they could easily understand that since they're spending a lot of money on education anyway, right? If we put a group of them together and they sponsored, you know, 50,000 kids, 100,000 kids, then we get the wheel turning and then amazing things can happen. So, uh, you know, I, I was not planning to, uh, you know, make a, um, a, a long presentation about edge makers, but again, we're, we're happy to talk about it with any of you that might be interested and, uh, uh, and that's why I'm here, aside from this wonderful collaboration with uh, IH, uh, IFHC and, and, and Endeavor. Hello, John. Is it working? Yep. yep. Well, uh, your presentation got me thinking a lot. Uh-oh. I uh, <laughs> just wanted to share a tiny part of it and, and, and get, get a comment from, from you. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, building capabil capabilities, and uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, approach because it's, uh, it's based on repetition and in routine. And uh, Frequently, people, when, when they deal with innovation or, or working with innovation, they kind of dream that their work will be always disruptive and not a day-by-day -day, uh, repetitive task. And there's a lot of anxiety. It's like, uh, we need to innovate now. We need to get it done. We need to, to create something new right now. And building capabilities, it's an exercise of patience. So it's, uh, what I see here is like uh, a conflict. Uh, uh, which comes out of people not understanding the necessity of building that capabili capability. And uh, the question is, uh, how do you see uh, as, as ways to deal with that anxiety, and especially with the fear that comes with it, the fear of changing, the fear of going to the unknown. And uh, especially, I got curious, curious how you do that with the children, because they are really impatient people. <laughs> That's pretty much I'll it. Collect another question and then answer. Okay, and then we'll. All sure. Okay. This is great comment. Um, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm a chemist. I consider myself an impetrenor. And uh, I'm inside the incubator. And I was shaking my head because I agree, totally agree what you said before, your comments. And. Uh, I'm not crying because you showed <laughs> the onion. <laughs> I have a huge list uh, to say about uh, how 
I'm five years inside the incubator um, uh, inside the USP, University of Sao Paulo, and uh, have a, a good experience what is innovation in Brazil, and I uh, have a list the things that work and no doesn't work, and but I, w I would not comment there. I would cry later, <laughs> alone probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that um, we have to think about, we are in the country that um, we watch in the premium time in the evening uh, soap operas. So 9% yeah, of the, <coughs> the people watch this and I consider uh, I consider this as a killing because all entrepreneurs or or the um, or the people that um, work in the soap operas like uh, entrepreneurs they are the bad guys they act like bad guys they make money so yeah. and always like that I would say that people should agree with me if uh, if you watch uh, it's been a long time I don't watch so the culture in Brazil is very complicated. Of uh, and uh, what you said that the I'm I did of course I have the the academia side as well and I completely agree the first thing that when you open uh, your own company people go in your back say ah, uh, your professor advice and say you <laughs> no now you you become an entrepreneur so you're gonna make money like. Uh, Gonna say to you now. Now you you are in the other side of the <laughs> the dark side. <laughs> the dark side of the thing. Right. So this is just a comment, and uh, yeah. it's very hard to change. Like you said, uh, very nice comment. All the culture of Brazil and uh, how the we have Mac. That's hard to to change. All the the Mac is the uh, is the minister of education to change all the grades. It's very hard to yeah. change of this and. Uh, we have a long pathway, and we have to be very. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, so I'll, I'll kind of respond to these, and then we'll adjourn. Is that the idea? Oh, maybe. Or if there is someone else interested. In okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. So. No, but get, you, I, I would advise you to uh, answer. Answer these, and then we'll move on. Okay. So um, first of all, this notion about the image of the entrepreneur, I think that's a very real uh, problem, and um, uh, I think. Uh, helping the public to see the entrepreneur correctly and to have examples of entrepreneurs who uh, create social value. I mean, not just social value like eating spinach social value, but they're, they're business entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs that have some positive impact on society is really important. And I think, sure, there are plenty of um, people who make a lot of money and are you know mean and dark and all that stuff, but um, people need to understand that money is a resource to make uh, enterprises happen. I mean, the government runs on money. It, it also prints money, I understand. So, you know, I, I think that, um, but I think the culture of money is dirty and, uh, uh, you know, business is bad and pure academics don't do it and, you know, so on. It, there's an image problem that has to be addressed. Um, the question about anxiety and fear is interesting. I mean, I remember, um, one of the things that helped me the most um, to improve my playing, which I still think of as being very, you know, kind of in need of improvement, is I went to a workshop uh, at Stanford. They have this adult one-week jazz institute in the summer. And uh, 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 there was a master class with uh, um, a very famous piano player and a bass player and a drummer. And, uh, and there were three people in the uh, session in the master class. Two of the others were one was uh, I think 18 and the other was 17, and there was me, and uh, I was very nervous. Right? And they would say, "Well, you know, play something." So I'd play something, and they say, "Play something else," and play something else. And you know, before long, you're out of ideas, right? And and meanwhile, you're kind of nervous. The thing that I learned from that was uh, that it, it's what the jazz musicians said in my presentation. You know, you have to go to the cutting sessions and get your rear end kicked, and then you go home and figure it out and come back. So it's practice. And by the way, anybody who's been in a real startup, in a real entrepreneurial situation, knows that it's an enormous amount of work. It is not a romantic fantasy about sitting behind a desk and, uh, you know, going on uh, Google and making a few phone calls and uh, picking up a check. You know, it's it's just not that way at all. I mean. You know, I never expected, you know, I mean, of course, I should have known better, but, you know, I'm working about 80 to 90 hours a week right now. And it's, it, there's a lot of very uh, basic work, you know, that has to do with uh, uh, mechanics, 
and you have to do it. I mean, if you don't do it, nobody else does it. So that's the practice part, right? And so for you in an incubator, I think that's perfectly fine. I'm not down on incubators, but I think that you're practicing, and so maybe the next time or next year or next month or whatever, you'll move on because your needs will be different, right? But the only way you know that your needs are different is because you've been practicing and you've been learning stuff, right? I mean, you're sounds like you've been learning a lot of uh, things. So in psychology, you know, back to the mysticism, right? If you, let's say you have a phobia, you have a fear. I, nobody in this room has a phobia, but you know, like you're afraid of heights or you're afraid of spiders or you're afraid of driving a car in, over bridges. Um, the, the therapy for phobias is called exposure. And what that means is that they push your face into the thing you're most afraid of until it becomes less of a big deal. So for me, it was, being in this master class with this 17 year old who was so good that it, I was embarrassed to even play one note, you know, and then I went home and tried to be better. Um, so the entrepreneurial career, uh, the other thing is that real entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs for a long duration. It's not like they just had an idea and did a project and then it's over, right? It's a way of life. And so, um, uh, the more they stick with it, the more they learn, the more exposure to the things that make them afraid, like, failing, you know, losing all the money they put into it or that somebody else put into it and being embarrassed, having people say, you know, you were stupid, you should have gone to law school or you should have, you know, had a job at some big company or something like that. You know, being, being, you know, sort of humiliated. All of these fears begin to go away because it's what I said earlier about you become your own teacher. You're not looking for validation outside yourself. If you fail and you know yourself, and you're your own teacher, who cares? You know, you pick yourself up. You know, you, you find another way of doing it. And you do it again. And you do it better. I mean, this idea that somehow a entrepreneurship is an academic discipline and, you know, I'm going to study the textbook and get all the right answers and then I know how to do it is completely wrong. It's like saying, I, I want to learn cooking by looking at pictures of food. Or I want to learn how to improvise jazz by reading a textbook. You know, I mean, I read lots of textbooks because that was what I thought was the right way to do it, but it doesn't get you where you need to go. It's, it's a practical, experiential discipline. Being an innovator is a practical, experiential discipline. The more you do it, the better at it you get. And the place to start is where you are. But it doesn't depend only on individual people's abilities. It needs the co culture oh. and institutions that are supportive. Absolutely right. So, so um, if you have the right people in a non-supportive environment, nothing will happen. I mean, look at China before 1949. You know, you had the same kind of people, you know, who are running Alibaba were in China before 1949, but the environment was, to say the least, not very supportive. Um, so I think, uh, of course, and you know, government plays an important role. Uh, you know, there are policy levers, there's incentives, there's uh, stimulus of venture capital, there's education programs, uh, there's um, you know, having you know a presidential candidate say uh, innovation is very important for the country gives people a sense of wow, you know, this is a national agenda, which of course it is, right? So um, having the right, uh, having an optimal environment or having an enriched environment is very important. But uh, that's one of the ingredients. And then, you know, guys like you are the other one. Right. Um, two more questions. All Hi, right, John. We'll uh, take two more and then maybe we'll call it a day. So Alex Hansen. Hi. Um, I'd like to know how do you see the innovation in Brazil? And uh, what are the biggest and more Im immediate opportunities in innovation you see at this moment in this country? One more question. Yeah. Uh, probably we agree that the traditional business plan model does not apply for the, the innovative, um, <coughs> uh, the very innovative businesses. Uh, and there's a lot of new business as modern generators <laughs> and different kind of and uh, a year and a half or two years ago um, Steve Blank launched a book a very good one it's called four steps to epiphany and uh, Steve Blank 
Yeah, yeah it's still blank. Yeah. And uh, there is a, a central uh, idea of the book uh, when they he says that um, he defines that you you can separate the winners and the losers, uh, and the winners uh, he defines the winners when the winners uh, when you listen to your customers before you start your business. My question is, when you have a very innovative business, you, you don't know who uh, you, you have to talk to. You know? what is, what's your personal advice for this case? Well, so my feeling is that um, any rule is dangerous because there's always an exception to it. Um, so I know Steve, and uh, Steve Blank, Blank, uh, by the way, is the, well, he would say he's the father of Lean Startup, but there are other people who are claiming the, to be the parent of Lean Startup. But he's a very smart guy, and he talks about how an entrepreneur uh, should not write a business plan. An entrepreneur should go and do interviews in the field with potential customers and build the business model from actual customer data, which is kind of like my innovation 3.0, you know, uh, basing the innovation on human experience, not on what he calls faith-based uh, entrepreneurship, which is, I know it's so good, uh, it's, I'm so smart, it's going to work, I don't need information from the market. And, you know, generally speaking, I think that's okay. Um, I think that it's certainly better than writing a business plan, which is, to me, at an early stage uh, venture, it's an empty exercise. It's a waste of time. Uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley don't read business plans, except maybe to get some ideas for other businesses. But they certainly don't care about the, your business plan. Um, I mean, they might want to look at a, a pro forma and um, you know, a bio biography and a page of bullet points, or you know, more likely they want you to tell them something. But they don't want to read business plans. So, um, but I, so that's, that's one opinion. However, okay, Steve Jobs said, um, I don't want to talk to any customers because they don't know what they want. I know what they want. And for the certain period of time, he was right, right? And so I think there are exceptions that prove every rule. I mean, you know, we did a fair, I, I, I feel like I spent 30 years doing market research, but I did not go out and interview 15-year-olds to ask them about edge makers, although we wound up doing pilots with about 1,000 students up until now, so we know that the, the material plays, plays well. So I think it's like anything else. You know, the rules are always a little dangerous. But lean startup as a methodology, I think, is great. And we actually have some lean startup principles in our curriculum. I mean, so I, I, I think that's all fine. With regard to uh, opportunities, I mean, that's a really long conversation. And I don't pretend to be uh, a big expert on the, 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 the breaking wave of opportunities here. But you know, I, I, we were in the taxi uh, uh, this afternoon, and the cab driver, who didn't look like a particularly sophisticated guy picked up his phone and spoke into it and Google uh, you know linked to waste and all of a sudden you know he knew where he was going and he had a very intimate connection with technology and I've never seen a cab driver in San Francisco do that right so so there's a kind of an technology intimacy that is a, a foundation that can be built on in a thousand different ways and especially when you start to link that to share economy so obviously one of the issues is trust Right, because share economy r involves trust. Right, like if you go to Airbnb, uh, I have to trust that your place is actually what you advertise, and it's not like a hell hell house. Right, you have to trust that I'm not going to throw your television set out the window. Right, so there's a social norms issue, but you know you think about why Airbnb is likely to have a valuation bigger than Hyatt Hotels, which actually owns physical assets. Airbnb is just a website, right? Or you look at the success of Uber and um, Sidecar and uh, Lyft, which are share economy uh, car services. Is Uber in uh, Sao Paulo yet? Yeah, okay, so, you, so, huh? No? Not yet, not yet, but it'll probably, I mean, it's, they, they, they have, uh, they raised, I think, three or four, five hundred million dollars of equity. So, I mean, they're a force to be reckoned with. So. You know, I think the share economy idea is interesting. I mean, uh, so I, I told, I think I mentioned to Sergio last night, you know, they did these studies that showed that something like 50% of American homes have a power drill 
you know, the thing that goes bzzz, and then, you know, you, and it's used about 10 minutes every five years. So that's an incredible waste of societal resources and money, right? I mean, why, why have a power drill that you use 10 minutes every five years? So uh, there are services now where you go and you rent the tools you need and you use them and you bring them back. And uh, it's much more sustainable, much more interesting. So I think, uh, I think uh, there, you know, I, I would look at all the foundational services. I mean, I think education is ripe for reinvention here, ripe. You know, the cover of Atlantic Monthly, which is a big magazine in America, the f headline on the cover is, is college doomed? Meaning, is college as we know it going to go away? And uh, I, I would say there's some truth to that, that col a lot of colleges will be like Blockbuster Video. Remember Blockbuster Video? It doesn't exist anymore. Because it was disintermediated. Because y you didn't need them to have the videos uh, because you could now get them directly. So now you can get Coursera, you can get all these things directly. You can't get the social experience yet. But you could look at Minerva University, uh, just Google them. I mean, they're trying to create a college experience, much lower cost, higher quality, no, infrastru no traditional infrastructure like buildings, right? So, um, you know, healthcare, education, personal transportation, personal services. So San one of the great things about living in San Francisco is it's, um, it's a laboratory for personal services. So, about eight months ago, Google uh, Express uh, started, and Google Express means, you know, it's Sunday night or Monday morning. I get up early, so six o'clock in the morning, I say, go to Google Express. I want milk, I want coconut water, I want a printer cartridge, I want a thousand sheets of paper, I want toothpaste, I want a toothbrush, push the button. Four hours later, it arrives. Charged my credit card in a nice package. So I thought that was pretty cool until uh, uh, about two months ago, there was, there's a new service that I have on my uh, phone, and um, it's 60 second, a uh, 60 minute delivery of uh, the same profile. You have, but this one you have to pay a little bit. Google is free if you buy more than $25 worth of stuff at any given time, right? So it's a website, right? But it's a total no tech opportunity that uh, is gonna roll out across the United States pretty soon. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And one of the reasons why Uber has such a big val valuation is because it it's a courier service that supports exactly these kinds of, of models. So, you know, I mean, I think there are a, lo a lot of services of this nature. You know, 3D printing. You know, you could argue that it's stupid to buy your own 3D printer. You could go, you know, now we go to the copy center to get our copies done. I think, you know, 24 months from now, you're going to start, or 12 months from now, if, you, if it's not already true, you will see 3D printing uh, uh, centers like copy centers in major Brazilian cities, and you'll go there to get your 3D printing done, right? Um, so um, there's no lack of opportunities, mm -hmm. tons. Abuse my prerogative. Oh, yeah, and sure. make one I can't resist I, I, it. I love being abused. No, no, no. Fine. The thing is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gently. Um, uh, I mean, most of the companies that you have named throughout your presentation yeah. are are American companies, mm. right? Most of the features to to which you pointed out as being positive to the innovation mm. are are can be found in America. Yeah, right. So how come you wrote a book about uh, the U.S. losing its no. innovation edge mm -hmm. uh, in in the in the in the world? And uh, mm. how how do you reconcile this too? apparently contradictory uh, facts. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I used examples that I thought everyone would know, and coincidentally, they happen to be American. But um, I think it's a really good question. I, I wrote the book Innovation Nation um, uh, because I was worried about uh, the future of innovation in America. I, I, America has had a really good run in the sense that right after World War II, it was the only country in the world that really had an innovation infrastructure. And everybody wanted to come there. Like my parents, for instance, came to America in 1949 because it was much better than living with Chairman Mao, right? And uh, th so talent, it was like a big magnet for talent. And all, you know, it was undamaged. All the universities were great, uh, uniquely great. And America at the time was responsible for 50% of global output in 1945. So it's pretty amazing, right? 
And um, uh, so that economic boom fueled a lot of innovation. And also, the other thing is, America has always had a culture which is uniquely supportive of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And that is, today, the one unique asset that America has remaining. I mean, it has many assets, but the one unique one is the forgiveness of failure and the willingness to tolerate wild ideas. Seriously. I mean, uh, and, and also the forgiveness of failure, uh, of failure if it's for good reasons, right? So in most countries, um, if you have a wild idea, a lot of people will not feel comfortable. If you fail, you know, you will have a problem being accepted in business society. Uh, and, and so this whole uh, culture, it, which is woven in the American national character and will be there as long as there is in America, I think is, is a great uh, advantage. However, um, you know, we're, we're having this uh, crisis in public education in America. The dropout rate in high schools is about 20% plus. So that means more than one out of five kids don't finish high school. And well, schools are not doing a great job of creating innovators and entrepreneurs, you know, I, I, at least in my opinion. Um, government has uh, adopted this somewhat, um, uh, you know, uh, libertarian notion that, or it's really a conservative notion, I guess, that government should not interfere with uh, 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 entrepreneurship. But at taken to an extreme, it means that um, there's a political battle around what the appropriate way to stimulate innovation and entrepreneurship is. So as of uh, today, but when I also wrote the book, there is no uh, U.S. national strategy and policy for innovation, none. Uh, there's the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which has launched this uh, BRAIN project, which is very cool. It's a three, four billion dollar project. So I think, you know, here's America, you know, very strong country. Three billion dollars is a, the brain initiative. Meanwhile, China's spending 500 billion dollars on their innovation agenda. Um, the, fe the roots of uh, basic academic science in America are er eroding. Uh, young scientists feel they can't get funding, they can't get advancement, uh, opportunities are more limited. So for the first time, there's reverse brain drain and young talented Americans are going to uh, Singapore and uh, going to uh, Holland and going to places where their careers have financial support and where they can get uh, going with the things they care about. You know, talent basically wants just a few things. They want the resources so they don't waste time and they want to be with people that are at their level so they'll, they'll learn a lot. And, you know, that's about it, right? I mean, give me the resources, give me a cool community, give me the money, I'm there. America's not doing such a good job of providing that in many, many fields. And so there is this phenomenon of, of, of brain drain. So there's, what made me upset is that um, leadership was not aware of this as a problem because the, the national narrative is, you know, we're good at this and we'll always be good at this. And the way I like to describe it, and I, I said this at a congressional hearing, is that, you know, Americans are starting to sound like the third generation rich, right? So the first generation, a, in an innovation sense, right? So the first generation is the, ca the, 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 the giants, right? And they build these big, you know, uh, institutions. And the second generation, you know, maybe advances it or preserves it. And then the third generation, you know, spends it and, er and, and basically erodes the foundation. And, um, you know, Silicon Valley is a very unusual subculture in America. It's 50 square miles. It's not the whole U.S., right? And meanwhile, you have many other places trying to emulate Silicon Valley, but, you know, without direction or without government support or a concentration of intellectual energy to really think through some of these issues. And, you know, I mean, you, you would say, oh, well, just the thing I said to you, you know, healthcare, education, big innovation opportunities. Look at what happened with healthcare reform. They had to get some ex-Google guy to bail them out of not having a decent website. You know, it's, uh, so the government is, is I think, um, uh, not the, it's not an enemy of innovation. You know, Obama says all the right things. I think if we had had a Clinton administration, we would have had a much bigger innovation agenda, but maybe we'll have one. Um, so, uh, I felt that it was no longer uh, appropriate to simply uh, uh, just um, feel lucky, you know, that the country really had to start thinking about its strategy. The other thing was um, a lot of Americans are operating from this playbook that we're uniquely innovative. 
But in fact, you know, there's now 50 countries around the world with national innovation agendas and budgets, and they're reaching out to each other. So, you know, uh, Chile is now collaborating with Finland and blah, 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 the Pacific Alliance, you know, et cetera. And um, America needs to take its place in this global innovation ecosystem. And there's, you can't find the people who are responsible for innovation in the U.S. government. Or if you do, it's just purely, um, well, let's see, I'm on camera now. It's, it's, it's often somewhat symbolic, you know? It's like, yes, I'm the head of the innovation uh, committee for the Secretary of Commerce. It's great to see you. Here's our brochure. You know, we're really interested in the innovation collaboration opportunities with China, blah, blah, blah. Great meeting. Here's my, here's my card, you know? And, and I'm not trying to be too negative because that's how a lot of public institutions work, period. But I'd much rather have uh, America have a narrative and a strategy. That's what I've, they're, they're you know, I mean, I, I've annoyed plenty of people because I keep saying this. For sure. So thank you for sharing yeah. your views, your Thanks. experience, and your music. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so Thanks. Okay, thank you.